Anton Troyer is professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University and is the author of many books. He has a BA from Princeton University and an MA and PhD from University of Minnesota. Troyer is a member of the governing boards of the Minnesota State Historical Society and uh, Wadukaning Ojibwa Language Institute and has received many prestigious awards and fellowships. Um, his fellowships include from the American Philosophical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Bush Foundation, the First Nations Development Institute, and the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. In 2018, he was named Guardian of Culture and Lifeways, and recipient of the Pathfinder Award by the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums, Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums. His equity, education, and cultural work has put him on a path of service around the nation and the world. And we're so delighted to have him be part of We Are Water Minnesota that's happening here at the Stillwater Public Library through December 3rd. And I'll close out our um, evening tonight with more information about the exhibit and how you can attend. But for now, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Troyer. You can take it away. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to see some familiar faces and some new people too. Kwe Maji Tayan Niwi Ojibwem Ajines, Mietago Dewindamunagug Awiyan. Wagosh Indigu Minawa Migazi and Dodim Kazagasquaji Mekag and Dunjiba. I wanted to start by giving you a brief shout out in my Ojibwe language to add that my native name is Wagosh, that means fox. I come from the Eagle Clan. So in the Ojibwe culture, there's a clan system where there are animals, birds, or fish that double as a symbol for your family and a spiritual guide of sorts. And I come from Leech Lake in northern Minnesota. I spend lots of time on both sides of the border. So Wadukudading Ojibwe Language Institute, which was mentioned in the introduction, is in the Hayward Lakes region. Uh, and I do a lot of work throughout. I've been to every single Ojibwe reservation and all the Dakota ones, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and you know, really throughout the whole region. And the topic that we're talking about tonight, logging, uh, the native experience with this particular point in history is one that has a really indelible impact on the native communities, uh, of course, on the environment that we all share now. And it's also one that I think gets glossed over or maybe even romanticized a little bit, um, looking at the roles of lumberjacks and, you know, whatever, pancakes as big as your plate or something. And people, you know, have these kind of romantic images about it. But I think it's really, really important, especially looking at the problems we're having in the world today for human beings just getting along with each other, for starters, and uh, also what we're doing to our planet, that we can learn a lot from this history. There's way more to unpack than we'll have time for even in our session tonight. So I thought what I would do is give you a few minutes on me for the benefit of those who didn't have a chance to do that the last time we met. But I'll also just lay out a couple of really critical historical times and events that intersect with tonight's topic, and then we'll take as many questions as we can in the time that we have. So I'll share a PowerPoint. I'll make sure that uh, the organizers get a copy of this, and then we're recording the session, and we'll figure out the best way to post and share that with everyone as well. In one of my recent books, The Cultural Toolbox, Traditional Ojibwe Living in the Modern World, I wrestle a little bit with some of the Ojibwe cultural concepts, including the relationship that Native people have with the land and the ways in which, you know, all human beings have, you know, an impact, an imprint on Mother Earth. That is unavoidable. But at the same time that we, we do that, uh, Indigenous people have lived in this region since the glaciers retreated 
you know, 11,000 years ago, sustainably harvesting the resources uh, without wiping out populations. And as we saw, you know, just in the early first settlement phase, we had logging, the birth of agriculture, places like Minnesota and Wisconsin honestly had some of the largest swaths of, of virgin pine forest in the entire country, also had some of the deepest mineral deposits, iron ore um, and other minerals, and some of the, you know, the greatest um, section of grade A agricultural land in the planet. So there was tremendous pressure on our resources. A lot of people don't realize just how different our climate was even a few years ago. So there was a what they sometimes call a mini ice age from 1550 to um, you know 1850, a time at which snowshoes were not a recreational luxury, but a necessity for getting from one place to another. The snow was so deep that the white-tailed deer migrated out of northern Michigan and much of northern Wisconsin and northern Minnesota because there was no way for them to get enough food. And instead, we had very abundant moose and woodland caribou throughout the region. Minnesota had an open season on woodland caribou through the early 1900s until they had hunted every last one to extinction. Uh, there's just one remaining herd of woodland caribou. It's actually in Ontario. Uh, and the remaining herds, when they were hunting out the caribou to extinction, were in indigenous places. They were at Boys Fort and they were at Red Lake. And ultimately, I think that's also a testament to the way that Native people interacted with the land and so forth. That doesn't mean that that Ojibwe people had a neutral way of interacting with the land. In fact, Native people intentionally used fire to clear underbrush, extending the range of the woodland bison um, and caribou, and also um, you know, fostering the propagation of blueberries and other things. Native people had an impact on their environment. They weren't just like you know, animals in the forest at the mercy of mother nature. We're all at the mercy of mother nature, but uh, native people shaped their environment, but in ways that were more symbiotic and kind of in connection with that. I think one of the things that some native people are, you know, trying to get perspective on now is that we've been through so much colonization, so much assault on our languages, cultures, ways of being, um, that ultimately a lot of indigenous people sometimes feel disconnected from the most central things to being us. Indigenous, among other things, means of the land. And we're at a time when 50% of our enrolled tribal citizens live off of reservations. 70% of self-identified Native people live off reservations. So even our connections to place are being pressured and shifted and changed. And as a result, I think some people just feel a little bit less than. So I, you know, I wrote this in the cultural toolbox. You're a complete, fully realized human being, a soul who has a body. You are the one your ancestors were praying for and waiting for through the generations. You've been given a unique set of gifts, and you yourself are a gift to the world. I'm not going to spend too much time on my personal introduction, but uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. My father wasn't native at all. So I show up brown and braids. I've actually got a man bun in today. Might be hard to see. But uh, my, my father was born in Vienna, Austria. He was an Austrian Jewish immigrant and a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. Spoke only German the first 13 years of his life. He has an amazing story. If you're interested to learn a little more when we get to Q&A, happy to share more. Uh, the short version is, uh, he got out of there at age 13, made it to America at age 14, lied about his age at age 17 to sign up for the U.S. Army, uh, hoping to kill Nazis, I think, but they sent him to the Pacific Theater, stationed in the Philippines, and eventually made his way to Minnesota, met my mom, and here I am. My mom, in my mom's family, uh, this is my 
great grandmother who is really the last generation where everybody was a fluent speaker of the language using you know kids using language just hollering at each other and all the everyday life things her daughter my grandmother was taken from her family as a small child and sent to residential boarding school like most of the kids in her generation uh, which caused a break uh, of connection to community family and place which she did a remarkable job of mending. She survived the residential boarding schools. She moved back to Bina on the Leech Lake Reservation, married a local boy, raised her family. For my mom, she grew up hunting, fishing in the North Woods. Um, and it's not an accident that Leech Lake, in spite of all the attacks and pressures on our land and resources, has the highest um, concentrated population of nesting bald eagles and some of the biggest stands of, of pine forest. Those things are directly connected to one another. Uh, there's an amazing story that she has that's also a little beyond the purview of, of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, but she was born on the reservation, lived her whole childhood on the reservation, went to high school there and only met one professional native person her entire childhood. That person was the school nurse. And so she finished high school and decided to go to nursing school. Her first job was working for our tribe's health program, and she thought, wow, even here on the reservation, Native people are getting pushed around. I'm going to do something about that. She went back to school and got a law degree and became the first female Native attorney in the state of Minnesota. So it was quite powerful for me growing up with her, hauling me to court. And I just remember, I can't remember her court cases, but I remember walking out of there thinking she was the only woman in court. She was the only native in court. And I kept thinking, you know what? We can do stuff. Made such a difference. When I was a kid, my parents were, you know, getting their lives started. My mom trying to find a pathway out of poverty and my dad trying to rebuild his life. For a time, we had no running water or electricity, wash up in the creek in the summer and enamel wash basins in the winter. I never felt poor, never had food insecurity, but we, as a result of this, we spent a lot of time in the woods, hunting, fishing, picking berries, making maple syrup and sugar. I probably stressed my parents out at many different junctures during my life, including when I graduated from high school and said, I'm, I'm going to leave town and never come back. And also when I finished college and said, I'm coming home and I'm never going to leave. I'm and I also said I'm not taking a job and I'm not going to be uh, going to grad school. I'm going to hang out with my elders and learn about our culture. And I said, oh, that's beautiful. Good luck paying for that because we're done. And I ended up living with this guy who is uh, from the St. Croix Reservation, uh, right on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. He lived in Balsam Lake, Wisconsin. And he was born in 1901. And he was about 12 years old the first time he ever saw a white man. He was about in his mid-30s the first time he saw a black man or a car, living his whole life in the St. Croix River Valley. And when I met him, he was in his 90s, and he was watching WWF Smackdown on a TV in a modern house and laughing really loud. And so I, uh, it, it always was a marvel to me how much change he must have seen during his lifetime. I ended up living on his couch and being his gopher. Go for this, go for that, drive me here, drive me there. And I learned a lot about our language and culture through that process. If you're curious about that experience or more about his life, I'm happy to share that too. That is actually a picture of him with the Dalai Lama at the conference in World Religions. There's some pretty good stories there. We brought him to the conference and the Dalai Lama really wanted to meet Archie Mose because Archie was the oldest spiritual leader in attendance at the conference. And uh, there's a big line of monks coming up and they were, they were bowing and Archie had never seen anyone bow before and he had no idea what to do. So he started patting everyone on the head saying, uh, it's okay, uh, that's all right. Unknown to him in the Buddhist tradition, it is the head is a sacred vessel. It's taboo to touch the head. And so the Dalai Lama stops the line and says, okay, how do you greet in your culture? He says, I don't know, shake hands. So the Dalai Lama says, okay, let's shake hands. And Archie says, no, like this. So they got the 
arm wrestler handshake, which I thought was especially cute. Here's my crew. We have nine children, big, beautiful, blended family. If any of you like kids, you let me know because we're always hunting for sitters. And in our family, there's been a process under that we've been going through for generations of reconnecting with our language, culture, community, and environment. And it's very connected to the real focal point for our talk tonight about logging in the North Woods. These are some images of my daughter. And as my daughter has grown up, she grew up as a fluent speaker of the Ojibwe language. And we've been able to restore the intergenerational transmission of Ojibwe. Uh, and even today now she teaches our language. She works at a high school and she's working also on a doula practice for rehabilitating indigenous birthing practices and things like that. And it's very heartening to see what's coming out of my children. I'll, there's more to share about some of our cultural practices related to the land, but I'll maybe share just one or two things that'll give you a sense for how this can work. This, this is an image of one of my sons. And we have a custom when someone has their first successful harvest of an animal, where we have a feast called a first kill feast. And in the ancient custom was that if someone harvested an animal for the first time, they would cook the whole thing and invite the whole wigwam village and feed everybody. And today, now we live much like everyone else. So instead of inviting the whole village, we will invite you know, quite a few people in our extended family and community. And there's a feast and a prayer, but instead of just eating, we ritually feed the successful hunter by taking a spoon of food and offering it to him and saying, saying his name, you know, Beja Gobanes, Lone Thunderbird. But he'd have to refuse the first bite and say, no, I'm thinking about children who don't have enough to eat. Ah, okay, so put it back, take another spoonful and offer again. And he'd refuse a second time saying, no, I'm thinking about my elders who can't get out in the woods to harvest for themselves. Hmm. Okay, put it back, take another spoonful and offer a third time. And he refuses again, no, I'm thinking of my family and community, people who came here today to support me. Ah, okay. And then offer a fourth time and then they can eat. And we'll say, you just changed your life. Because up until today, you were what we call the dependent. You depended on all the people in this room to provide all of your food. But today, you are providing for all of us. And that's what it means to be an adult. And from today on, you'll have a special power. And it's the power to gather resources when you go hunting, fishing, um, ricing. And when you'll do this when you get a job, too. So when you use your power. Think about kids who don't have enough and elders who can't get it for themselves, your family, your community. They give away the rest of their kill packaged up venison. So they're impoverished, but rich. And I guess one of the things that's worth sharing is that I have seen in my own children that this ceremony has been really formative for them. Uh, one time I had a friend complaining, oh, my back, I can't get out in the woods. I don't know the last time I had any venison in my freezer. And my son was about 16. He didn't say anything, but he went out in the woods. He harvested a deer. He cleaned it up, packaged it up, went to my friend's house, filled up his freezer. And my friend called and said, I, I'm so blown away. I, I didn't even know people remember that teaching. What a fine young man. Can I give him some gifts? Well, sure. Same kid, senior year in high school. He had, uh, um, he and his buddy were going to double date to the prom and so I got him hooked up with a tux. And then my, his friend's mom said, my next check, I'll get you the tux, I promise. And then her car went down and she had to tell him, I'm so sorry, but I, I can't. So he's all heartbroken, ready to cancel his prom date. My son said, forget that, come with me. So they went to the tux place. My son canceled his tux, took the money. He went to the Goodwill, bought a couple suits and everybody went to the prom. He didn't tell me about any of this, but I went to the prom for the pictures. And I was like, that kid's wearing a suit. What happened to the tux I ordered for him? And then I finally got the story. And I said, well, son, if you would have just told me, I, I would have I got that kid a tux. And he said, but dad, it's my job to look out for people who don't have enough. 
And so one of the things I learned is that these kind of cultural practices, sure, they reflect values, communal, collective, collaborative, but they shape those values too. And so there's a lot in that cultural toolbox that affects this whole logging story that I want to talk about. I've seen some really cool things happen. I shared a little bit about our family's kind of efforts to reconnect language and regrow language, culture, custom, and so forth. There's been a collective story ongoing as well. These are some of the elders in Mille Lacs that have been building Rosetta Stone for Ojibwe, books for Ojibwe, um, some really remarkable accomplishments. And I'll kind of go quickly through it so I can get to the history stuff for you. But um, there's much more to say about what is happening there too. And all of these things, language, culture, land, environment, the health of the water, all of these things are deeply interconnected. Here's one of my elders, ancestors in my family tree, famously photographed as well. Yeah, I've got the name John Smith later in life, which is ironic. No connection to the one from Pocahontas mythology. He was born in the late 1700s and he died in 1922. He lived in parts of three centuries. He was in our area before there were any white settlers and he was still in our area when the soldiers came back from World War I. He was in our area when all of Minnesota was indigenous land. And he was in our area when native people owned only 4% of their own reservation at Leech Lake. In reservations like Leech Lake, natives own 4% of their own reservation. At White Earth, natives own 9% of their own reservation. In some places, natives are minorities on their own reservations. And the logging has everything to do with it. You've probably seen famous pictures like this, Oklahoma land rushes and stuff like that. What a lot of people don't realize is that most of the Oklahoma land rushes took place not just on native lands, but took place inside Indian reservations. No sooner did we go through the treaty process, and I'll say a little more about treaties and how they worked um, today too, but no sooner do they do that, then they realize that there are all these vast resources inside reservations. They include the timber resources in places like Minnesota, the iron and mineral ore, you know, in places like Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan, they include agricultural land and they include oil. There's a book, there's a movie coming out on Friday this week about the Osage murders and the creation of the FBI, which profiles how some of that happened in Oklahoma. Uh, but at the time, you know, reservations, you're probably familiar that there are these chunks of land that they were trying to remove Native people to and concentrate them on. But at the time that they started, with allotment, and you, you may not be familiar with allotment, but allotment is taking the land that was collectively owned inside of a reservation. And instead of having it be owned by everyone or owned by the tribe for the benefit of everyone, they chopped up the reservation into individual parcels. And you know, then they were able to do this. They kept 50 million, 50 million acres to allot to the natives and they took 105 million acres, twice as much land, and opened it up for free to white settlers. So allotment was not just about the benefits of private land ownership. That's how they framed it. But the reality is it was about getting these lands out of native hands. And this is how you get to some of the land ownership stuff that I was talking about. Each reservation has its own story about how people came after the land. So treaties are part of it. Acts of Congress are part of it. The creation of national parks and forests is part of it. And I'll give you an example of each just so you can get a sense for how they work. Examples from our area. So this is just a little treaty map. And it's very interesting, but if you look at the treaties that Ojibwe people signed, um, you know, across the 1830s, 40s, and 50s uh, in the region that most of you are calling home, 
the Ojibwe insisted that they not sell any lands. And first of all, just imagine what a difficult time this was for native leaders, right? If you said, we're not selling anything, we will fight you if you come here. And some tribes fought famously like the Lakota, usually it didn't go too well. There was some kind of conflict and then people were had their land taken away anyways by force. If you were kind and accommodating and said, we refuse to fight you, we are your best friends, we will never have a conflict with you, but we really insist that we don't want to sell our land, you didn't get to do that either. They'd move you off on a trail of tears, which is exactly what happened with the Cherokee and many other tribes. They never fought a war with the United States but they were deprived of their lands anyways. It's one of the things that's just hard, you know, to grapple with about American history. All the stories of people fleeing religious persecution, you know, or economic malaise and coming to America and starting a new beautiful life are also the stories of taking those things from native people. There's no way around it. The first boatload of pilgrims did not arrive in a vacant wilderness. They arrived at a Native American village site. And the Native people were terrified at the sight of these newcomers and at first ran into the woods. So the pilgrims got off their boat, went into the village, and the first thing they did was take all their food. The first act was an act of theft. And then they built a pilgrim village right where the Native village was and displaced the Native population and kept it going until they got to this region. Same story. Ojibwe people understood. Sometimes I think it's a little too simple with, if people say like, oh, natives didn't understand treaties or didn't understand legal concepts. Native people understood a lot of things. They just had a very different concept. So native people understood that there was land that they would exclude other people from. So the Ojibwe even famously fought some of their native neighbors for control of land and territory. The Ojibwe also understood that there was some land that you could share with your neighbors. The Ojibwe had friendly relationships with the Ottawa and the Potawatomi, at times the Cree. Uh, and as a result, there would be shared use areas. Both groups would hunt, fish, gather. There's a lot of intermarriage and so forth as well. And that actually happened with the Dakota too, although it's a complex story. And so when it was treaty time, the Ojibwe had a kind of unique situation compared to many other tribes. Imagine what's going on in the United States at the time of the US Civil War. So at that point in time, it's only been you know just a few decades since you had the War of 1812. You know, It's been half of a person's lifetime. In the War of 1812, the British army came and burned Washington, D.C. America's sovereignty wasn't secure. During the U.S. Civil War, which is when a lot of these treaties are happening right before, during, and then right after the Civil War. And during that time, you know, not only are the North and South fighting each other, but the British are financially supporting the Confederacy. Canada is part of England. The Ojibwe population straddles the US Canadian border. We didn't cross a border, the border crossed us. And as a result, the US Army couldn't afford to like chase natives into Canada and start a war with the British. At the same time that the, you know, revolution that the Civil War was not going that well for the Union for the first couple of years. And so the Ojibwe had a little different diplomatic position. One of the greatest vulnerabilities for native tribes when there were times of conflict was that the U.S. could field a professional army and all of their family members, their kids, were safe from conflict zones back in Boston or something when the soldiers are out fighting in North Dakota or whatever. And so as a result, native people didn't have that luxury. So all you had to do was attack their families or attack their food supply. Because the other thing that native people had to do is be full-time providers. That's why they killed 60 million buffalo. 
There's a great PBS documentary, Ken Burns documentary on the Buffalo playing on PBS right now. It's a multi-part series. They killed 60 million Buffalo so they could starve tribes into submission instead of have to fight them. They replaced those 60 million Buffalo with 107 million European Buffalo cows. Not because that was practical or humane, but so they could subjugate the people who depended on the Buffalo, right? All of this is going on. While this is going on, the Ojibwe realize that, you know, fighting a big protracted war is going to be difficult. But because of this U.S.-Canadian border thing, it was conceivable to both the Ojibwe and to the United States that Ojibwe people could move their kids to Canada out of conflict zones and field an army that didn't have to worry about defending their little children right there or providing for them all the time. And so the U.S. government was a little more reluctant to go too hard on the Ojibwe and commit an immediate genocide to get these treaties. At the same time, the Ojibwe wanted to press for the best terms, but didn't want to get into open conflict. They saw what happened to some of the neighboring tribes, even to the Tecumseh's Confederacy, you know, some decades before. And so at the time of treaty, the Ojibwe leadership across all of these treaties you see in this map here said, we are not going to sell any land. We will agree to change the status of some of our lands from exclusive Ojibwe use to shared use with the newcomers. And we will reserve for ourselves some tracts from which all others are excluded, reservations. So reservations were to be exclusively indigenous space and the rest of the land, the rest of that orange stuff there was to be shared with Ojibwe and everybody else. So it is actually incorrect to characterize the treaties as land sale agreements because the Ojibwe didn't sell, they changed the status of the land. That's a very important distinction. I ended up doing expert testimony for the four Lake Superior Ojibwe tribes in Wisconsin when they litigated this very issue. And the case was decided in summary judgment because the evidence was so overwhelming. There's just voluminous correspondence from the United States government saying that, you know, they're sending traders or missionaries into Wisconsin and the US government was telling them, you need written permission from the chief just to go to the reservation. That's their exclusive land. And they, you're gonna run into them all over Wisconsin. They have a right to be anywhere there, right? So a very different understanding than most people think of when they think of the treaties. All of this being was just verified in the most recent court decision, which among other things, changes the status of lands like, even in spite of everything that the agreements and the treaties said, when Native people owned lands, including allotment lands, they were often taxed by municipalities and then taken in tax forfeitures. And it was verified that none of that should have been happening. And so it changed the status of many, many acres of land in Northern Wisconsin just last year to non-taxable lands the parcels that were owned by that are still owned by native people what has yet to be litigated and you know rendered more just is all of the taking without just compensation and the denial of native people to access the lands that they retained access and use rights to so that's an ongoing issue from the treaty history within the area that you call home so that's one dimension of of the story of course, this was all about getting at the logs and getting at the minerals and the other resources. There's a great document that um, there's a petition from the chiefs of Wisconsin to um, the president of the United States. And it's called, now we call it a statement made by the Indians and it's all in Ojibwe. And they actually said, we only understood that we would be sharing use of the land, including the cutting of some trees but never that we would be excluded from using the land or living on any part of it. 
I'm going to look briefly at, at what was going on in Minnesota uh, at the same point in time and kind of coming into the 50s and 1850s, 1860s, and really right up to the 1900s. They're starting with allotment there too, and they were trying to do all kinds of things. They were trying to relocate all of the Ojibwe people to White Earth in northwestern Minnesota. They actually tried to relocate everyone to Sandy Lake back in 1850, but the U.S. government, Sandy Lake is in central Minnesota, if you know the McGregor area, big Sandy Lake. Uh, and when they were doing that, there were thousands of Ojibwe people came from Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota there. And it was in at pretty much this time of the year, but they kept people there well into the winter. And they fed bad rations, moldy flour and bad meat. About 400 people died on the spot. And lots of other people got dysentery and they just ran for it and ran back to the communities they came from. And I think honestly, if the US government had even just like had decent provisions, you might've had some different historical outcomes from the 1850 removal order and the Sandy Lake annuity fiasco, but it, it completely backfired for the government. By the time you get to the implementation of allotment in Minnesota, and again, there's a lot of history to unpack and we're not gonna have time for like a whole Indigenous Studies 101 class, but essentially you've got the U.S. government trying to get their very first land sessions at Red Lake, and I'll speak to that a little more in just a minute, and at the same time, they're also trying to relocate people to White Earth and implement allotment everywhere. Some of those things are all contradictory. Why would you want to do allotment if you're trying to move everybody to White Earth and, you know, things like that? But essentially, they needed to get consent from tribal members to make it happen. And so these are just legislative things that I'll, I'm briefly mentioning. I won't go into too much minutia here, but you can see different ways in which they start thinking about getting at the timber. So um, the Morris Act in 1902 allowed for the cutting of timber on allotments. So it said white people can cut the timber from native lands. Right, it's an enabling mechanism. Um, the clap rider in 1904 that was still moving too slowly, so it said uh, we'll remove any remaining restrictions on cutting timber on native lands. And then there's another one in 1906 that said that's still too slow. Just let natives sell the whole land. And so you actually had only eight human beings in the state of Minnesota as the primary profiteers over all the cutting of timber. So if you go to St. Paul and look at the, you know, Hill House, which is very close, you know, right in, in central St. Paul, who's big timber tycoon. That was most of the money. The town of Walker, Minnesota, named after another timber tycoon. There were eight human beings who got most of the money from all of that effort. And most Native people lost their allotments within their lifetimes. It was very rare that somebody got to hand their allotment off, you know, over one generation, much less all the way up to the present time. I think White Earth only has two allotments that stayed in Native hands out of all those families. And so there are many different ways that they were trying to get at, at Native lands. So allotment was one. By the way, there's a friend of mine at, named Joe Aganosh uh, from White Earth who passed away now. Uh, but he, one time I was recording Ojibwe stories and he said, you got to see this. And he got a shoebox down, pulled out an old grocery receipt from the Roy Lake store. And he said, look at that. What do you think that is? And I was looking at it. It says, it looks like a handwritten grocery receipt for $24. He said, that's my family's allotment. The grocer at Roy Lake went to the allotment officer and said, this family owes me money for groceries. They're never going to pay me. I demand that you give me their 160 acre land allotment to settle the grocery bill. And so the grocer got the 160 acres and the family got a bill marked paid for $24 worth of groceries. So he kept the grocery receipt. And there are many, many stories like that. It is incredible what was going on in Wisconsin and Minnesota during this time period. You have the birth of the industrial age. Right. So they're they're harvesting iron ore and they are 
turning it into steel and iron, and they are making railroads and railroad tracks and this huge, you know, large scale industrialization. And so they are relying on resources in our area to do it. America also has an explosion of its industrial production of ships um, and housing and so forth. It's exponential. And Minnesota and Wisconsin are supplying most of the raw materials. At the same time, you also have this huge explosion in agricultural production. So during the Civil War, America was a producer of you know, cotton and other um, agricultural products and just starting to export that. We became the largest producer of food in the world then, and we've, we didn't stop. So all of these things are booming all at the same time, and it's right in our region where all the pressure is on. So, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and they found the ways. So sometimes it surprises people because we think like the creation of a national forest, for example, is a positive ecological thing. But actually, the way America maintains its forests is it is a federally federal government run business operation. The national forests are cut and they are cut by clear cutting. So on the Leech Lake Reservation, where I'm from, they actually created the Chippewa National Forest. And if you look at, I didn't actually throw a map in here of the Chippewa National Forest, but the reservation itself is kind of strangely shaped, weird boundary, but it's roughly 40 miles by 40 miles. It's pretty big. The Chippewa National Forest goes right on top of it and takes up 85% of the reservation. So when they created the Chippewa National Forest, they told the natives who were living on that reservation, you have to take allotments in the remaining 15% of the reservation or move to White Earth to take your allotment. So it essentially pushes native people into these tinier plots in, in central villages like Bina, where my family's from, that are inside the, the Chippewa National Forest or take private allotments outside of the forest or move to White Earth. And so this is how Leech Lake ended up owning 4% of its own reservation, was through the creation of the Chippewa National Forest. So this went through phases. In 1908 was the initial legislation. It gets redefined in 1928. Um, and so there were you know, trust land accommodations at village locations like in Bina, um, Ball Club, and so forth. But this greatly, greatly um, increased the poverty of people. By the way, they also started building dams at the same time. And there are all kinds of dams went up across Wisconsin and Minnesota during this time because that was the easiest way to move timber to market. So you, you dam up you know, the big rivers and native people, because of this unique circumstance I was explaining a couple of minutes ago, kept land on all of the 10 largest lakes in the state of Minnesota. That wasn't by accident, it insisted on that. All 10 lakes got down. And then they flooded wild rice and lowbush cranberry crops, staple foods for native people, which forced them into greater dependence on government rations so that they could then manipulate native people into further treaty and other kinds of negotiations to get more land out of their hands. Red Lake was still dealing with land session stuff in the 1900s. Those done through acts of Congress. There's much more to these stories. So I've got a couple of books. The Assassination of Hole in the Day um, speaks about Ojibwe leadership in central Minnesota and does detail what was going on with White Earth and also Leech Lake, including in the last chapter about creation of the Chippewa National Forest. And then there's another story at Red Lake which I'll give, give a couple minutes to because it's, it's so pertinent um, to what was going on. And I'll speak to some of the ecological things as well as the political things going on there. So, you know, you can get vertigo just looking at all of the maps and all of the things that Red Lake had to deal with. The U.S. government stopped making treaties in 1871. That had nothing to do with we all already got all the land out of the natives. It only had to do with the fact that ratifying treaties was like um, ratifying Supreme Court appointees. Only the U.S. Senate dealt with treaties. 
And all these folks in the House of Representatives wanted to get their hands in the native business. And so they stopped making treaties, which would force all things native land related to go through acts of Congress, which involved both houses of Congress. That's all it was about. It was a Potomac two-step. So when at that point in time, everything on the left side here, this was all Red Lake land, unseated, over 3 million acres. So to get at that, they had to use acts of Congress, um, which in Minnesota meant the Nelson Act. There's this guy, um, he who is spoken to, and there's, you know, there's a whole chapter on him in the Warrior Nation book. I won't be able to spend too much time. But the bottom line is simply this. He who has spoken to and the other Red Lake leader said, we will never do allotment. We will never move to White Earth. And we are only willing to talk about changing the status of some of our land to shared use if we retain exclusive possession of all of Upper and Lower Red Lake. So Upper and Lower Red Lake, you know, those two lakes are huge. Just looking at the maps here. Right? It is 87 miles of undeveloped lakeshore and some of the most pristine wilderness in the entire state of Minnesota, as well as the cleanest aquifer in the state of Minnesota. And so they said, we're not going to sell any of that. At the negotiations, they, Henry Rice, and who, by the way, Rice, Minnesota is named after. He's a famous early Minnesota politician. Um, he was doing the negotiations at the Nelson Act, and he could not get native people to make any concessions he wanted to get some land severed off of at least upper red lake for um floating logs out of the area and the red lakers wouldn't agree they finally had an agreement that included exclusive ownership of all lands all around upper and lower red lake including at least a mile of lakeshore around both and then henry rice went to washington dc and turned in a totally different map one that would cut off this big section, whoops, from the Red Lake Reservation on the right-hand side. So the Red Lake was supposed to have all of this land around Upper Red Lake, and it was cut off. They didn't even know because they agreed that they would keep all of the land. Henry Rice turned in a different map that was never shown to them. And then they didn't know because it took decades for them to actually get up there and do the surveys. By then, it was very difficult for them to revisit the treaties. They were under so much pressure. So all of that has yet to be litigated or resolved. And now at, a, at Washkish, you've got white families who've been living there for three generations. And what are you going to do to make that right? You know, you can't take that, that away from them and force them to relocate. They'll be all up in arms about it and it'd be politically difficult. So you almost need a political solution that would redefine the Red Lake Reservation boundary as originally agreed, and then, you know, do a land back agreement where the public parcels of land transfer to the tribe, and then individual white landowners can keep their land and bequeath it to their kids, but anytime they want to sell, the tribe could <clears throat> retain a right of first refusal and buy them out over time. So, that has yet to be agreed or sorted out, but that's something that is, you know, people are thinking about. All of this was a complete environmental catastrophe. So some people don't realize that Minnesota actually has some trace elements of salt in the soil. So if you go out to like, you know, what they some used to call Devil's Lake, Spirit Lake, North Dakota, by Fort Totten, and you catch a walleye there, it has actually a much higher salinity to the water than in a place like Red Lake. You could take a walleye from Red Lake, drop it into Fort Totten, it would die because of the salt level. But there's still salt across our entire region. One of the things that happens, like when native people would do fires to like burn underbrush and propagate blueberries, it would leave all of the tall timber. But when the logging enterprises came in and they clear cut everything, then when there was a fire, it burned deep into the duff. You get more soil erosion, both from water and from wind. And then the water from rain and snow melt percolates much deeper into the soil and it pulls up the salt. 
essentially the clear cutting salts the forest. They would have to leave it alone for about 600 years for it to recover. This causes the trophic cascade that implodes the woodland caribou and moose populations, the timber wolves, um, and so forth. And we still haven't recovered. The animal populations still haven't recovered. When you cut pine trees, what grows up next are popple, aspen, and they grow like grass. The popple is actually good forage for ruffed grouse and white-tailed deer, but it's pretty much bad for all the other species that were indigenous to the area. And so in our area, we have lots of white-tailed deer and grouse, and we don't have any more caribou, and our moose herd is declining. And there are other things like the um, having winters less cold and the tick diseases and stuff like that that are impacting moose. In Panema, it's interesting in the Ojibwe culture, if you didn't agree with something, then like a treaty or whatever, you just wouldn't go to the arrangement. And if you weren't there, they could not decide without you because we had a consensus-based political culture. So interestingly, when you look at all this Red Lake history here, the treaty in 1863, the Nelson Act, 1889, you know, and the Western Townships, I didn't even put in a map for that. No one from Panema signed any of those agreements. They refused, they boycotted, they said, we don't agree to any of this. But the US government considered all of those agreements binding on all of the people, including the Ojibwe villages at War Road and Rozo, which did not sign any of the agreements, or Panema, which did not sign any of the agreements. And they came in and they clear cut Panema Point um, Warroad and Rozo, even though the native people there never agreed to any of these things. That's the American political process and how it affected things. So you had huge environmental impacts. Now, there's much more to say and unpack about each of these and many other stories. And I want to make sure that um, we got a little time for questions, but I'm going to share something else so we're not all gloom and doom. This is a view of our family property. And when my parents were kind of getting started, they had actually put in a bid on a piece of property that had been taken in a tax forfeiture, but it didn't look like this. If you turn around and look up the hill, it looked like this. Wide open farm fields. That's my dad on the tractor with my brother there. And what they did is they started planting trees and they planted all of the trees in that picture right there. It completely transformed the entire landscape and the ecosystem. And this is where I live now. So I, you know, for me, it's not just that there's this beautiful, pristine wilderness, which is all covered with conservation easements and things like that. But I think about what a couple of human beings can do when they set their minds to protecting our planet and trying to engineer justice. And it gives me a lot of hope. You know, a lot of times we look around and think, man, what can I do about all these problems we've seen in the world, you know? climate change, race relations, politics, all the historical and contemporary oppressions and injustices. And a lot of us think there's not a lot I can do about that. Try to be a decent human. I'll tell my kids to be decent humans and I hope it's enough and it's never quite enough. But it's not like we've got to take these, you know, problems that humans have been making for thousands of years, a whole mountain's worth and move that mountain right now. It's more like, we need to keep planting the seeds and it can change everything. And that's the work. So we do this stuff. Sometimes we have, we've had up to five generations in our family harvesting maple syrup and sugar on the family property. And I really do believe we can make things different and better. So I'm going to conclude my formal remarks at this point in time, but we'll keep this open and take some questions for a while until Heather tells me it's time to knock it off. And uh, I really appreciate you all showing up today and leaning in to an important conversation. And I look forward to, uh, to fielding some of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Troyer. I really appreciate it. Um, we do have some questions that people submitted through the registration. So I'm gonna just start with one that I think is a really good um, 
really good to what you just were talking about, engineering justice. I love that. Um, somebody asked, with climate change, many trees are expected to move north, in effect, no longer surviving in Minnesota. Um, as a longtime resident of the state, I feel this loss deeply, especially for such iconic trees as the paper birch. How do we prepare young people for these changes that will likely occur during their lifetime? Yeah, I don't pretend to have a simple or easy answer for that. It is true that the boreal forest is not going to be able to survive consistently warmer winters. So that means the paper birch and the balsam, uh, the range for them is going to be pushing northward and the range of the hardwoods will extend northward. We're actually seeing maple trees in the boundary waters, which is something that never happened before. Uh, we're seeing the, the flyways, the Thief River flyway for ducks and geese is gonna be sitting right over Thunder Bay, Ontario, you know, within uh, 50 years or so they're anticipating huge changes. So all of this means, and then also like the future vitality of wild rice, which requires, you know, cold weather climate and muddy bottomed lakes that are shallow. Um, the range used to go all the way down to Missouri, you know, and way up into, you know, central Manitoba, but it can only go so far north when you hit Canadian shield country. Paper bakes suited for uh, wild rice. So there's a real question mark about the future vitality of wild rice too. So all of that means that things are going to be really different. Um, there's no way to just stop the tide. I mean, you never know what Mother Earth is going to do, right? Like Yellowstone could blow tomorrow and reset the climate clock. You know, it's possible. But at the same time, you know, we don't, there, our, our power to really affect the whole environment is fairly limited. I'm sure we will try. Like they're already building machines to like suck carbon out of the atmosphere, but that could have other kinds of consequences that could be quite devastating for our climate, which we don't even fully understand. Uh, so I do think that it is possible that we will have a really different environmental circumstance. And we have, you know, humans are actually pretty adaptable. You know, it might not... I think realistically, we will not end up quite like Blade Runner, if you remember those things where they like, there's just like cockroaches and maggots and stuff left on the planet and they, you know, press them into protein blocks for nourishment and stuff like that. I mean, we're capable of hydroponic fish farming on the top of skyscrapers and growing food indoors and all kinds of things. But I think that there will be huge trophic cascades and implosions of major vital ecosystems and that the quality of life for humans will be negatively impacted um, over the entire planet. So I, I don't think we should be apocalyptic and overly fearful, but I do think that we need to make smart and sensible decisions that will mitigate the damage and risk to us. And, you know, I like this quote often attributed to Chief Seattle, but I think speaks to a broader view man is not given dominion over the earth. We are part of the web of life, not its masters. Whatever we do to one part of the web affects us. In Ojibwe culture, you may have seen like the floral beadwork designs and things like that. It's not just a reminder of verdant growth and the beauty of the natural world, but it's a humble reminder that all those growing things and all the animals, birds, and fish were created and put here before us. We are dependent on them. If we perish from the earth, I'm probably better than ever. But if any of those things were to perish, surely we would too. So we do have to be very careful and feel the you know kind of weighty responsibility, um, you know, to affect the change. Yeah, I saw there was a comment in the chat. Did any non-natives try to help and get justice during those treaty times? Well. You know, not all humans are awful. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, you know, like you could say the same thing about Nazi Germany. There, there were Oscar Schindlers, you know, who were trying to do the right thing. They were outnumbered and outgunned and overwhelmed. 
and some pretty horrible things happened during the Nazi Holocaust. Um, and there were people who, you know, had parallel or, you know, comparable perspectives about all kinds of things, some of whom did do good and positive things, non-Native people. Um, and, you know, since then, America's just on the, on the verge of trying to, you know, do some kind of justice-oriented public actions. I, you know, Canada has had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, has, you know, looked at restorative justice measures. You can't make, make up for like hundreds of years of oppression and lost lives, right? You're not going to fix the Nazi Holocaust either because all the people who died don't even get to have babies, right? Like everybody else who lived gets to have babies and feel guilty about it, you know? There's no way to totally fix that. But what we can do is look at restorative justice. So in Canada, they're appropriating money for indigenous language revitalization. Um, we have seen the, even in Minnesota, some land back efforts, which are largely symbolic, but are starting like um, at Leech Lake, there was an 11,000 acre parcel. Um, the govern, you know, the stewardship of which was transferred to the tribe in the Chippewa National Forest. Now, in my view, there's no reason you couldn't trust the tribe to steward the entire Chippewa National Forest as a restorative justice measure. We've seen the first steps of that. And maybe it'll be piecemeal, too slow, but it's better than nothing, you know. Uh, but but that's happening. I'm on the governing board for the State Historical Society. We repatriated a small, more symbolic, but significant 20-acre parcel to the Lower Sioux community. And within Minnesota legal statutes, we actually had to acquire other land in another part of the state to put into state, you know, conservatorship to offset the one being repatriated to the tribe. But when we did the repatriation, um, you know, commemoration, the tribal chairman was on the call and he was saying, my dad said they would never, ever, 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 ever do this. And we just did this. And he was crying. You know, so I have seen things, you know, then and now that give cause for hope and kind of point to future directions. But, you know, I, I think there just needs to be so much more. It's like when, when you hurt someone you love, you don't just say sorry one time and then done and we never talk about it again. Sometimes you apologize every time the hurt feelings come up. And sometimes you do restorative acts repeatedly until things are right. And I, I think America sometimes struggles to even hold space for the telling of the story. We're hung up on American exceptionalism. We don't want to look in the mirror. But I think it's an act of emotional maturity to do so because we can't get to healed and skip the healing and we can't get to reconcile and skip the reconciling. I think a lot of your um, talk today was framed with the treaties and the political decisions that were made. Um, so this question comes from um, a register. Uh, anyway, any thoughts on how Minnesota or Wisconsin's land protection ever, uh, efforts could better serve indigenous communities. And I think you've spoken to that about some land back, but are there other preservation efforts that you see have, um, have a way to serve indigenous communities? Oh yeah, there's so many things we can and should do. First of all, for both Minnesota and Wisconsin, the Department of Natural Resources for each state is charged with two really contradictory and conflicting missions. Number one, they're supposed to protect the natural resources of the state. That's usually what most of us think of. But number two, they are also supposed to develop the natural resources of our state. As a result, when there's a decision like, should we build the, the mine or should the pipeline be approved? It happens internally within one agency, usually behind closed doors that they're making these kind of decisions. I really believe structurally, we should have two agencies. One, that is just about protecting our natural resources. And another, that is about 
the development of our natural resources. You can make a case that it's important to do both, but then they would both advocate those positions and it would happen in a public context, kind of like when you have a, a trial, you have a defense attorney and a prosecuting attorney, both are entitled to be represented and to make their cases, you know, and then we the people should decide what happens. And so I think there's a structural change we should insist upon so that all of these decisions are much more transparent because normally what happens, we have very few regulations, even on a pipeline, how often do you put a stop valve, you know, which would limit the size of a spill when they break because they all break. You know, that's something we could regulate. But if you have different agencies that are going to argue both sides, then we would all be part of it and could have some sort of influence on those things. So I think that's good democracy, power to the people, and better accountability. Um, with regard to specific Native stuff, you know, there are so many different issues at play. And I, I just think, you know, right now we are getting deluged with really bad information. For starters, all of our press of all political persuasions, they're interested in headlines and drama. You know, like even when a storm comes, they're like, the storm of the century, da, 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 you know, even if it's not, because if it's not super dramatic, no one's going to click or share, you know? And as a result, we tend to amplify the problems and obfuscate the more deeper and nuanced understanding. You know, I miss like Walter Cronkite, who'd say, some are saying this and some are saying that, and the facts are these. And, you know, like you could actually have a more nuanced understanding and debate. And so I think it's just incumbent upon us to try to get good information, um, to speak to one another. We're often in echo chambers. And I, I think we need not just the yelling and the, you know, the, uh, fighting over things, but I, I think we just need good information so we can steward the efforts for better results. I, I think when it comes down to it, it's pretty appalling that in a state like Minnesota, they recommend that you don't swim in any of the lakes in southern Minnesota, right? Wide open farm country. And it's because it's farm country, of course, because we do chemical farming instead of anything natural. You know, but if you can't put your toe in the water, how can we eat all the food that is produced where it's dropped with GPS precision on top of each plant? You know, using chemicals that are banned in Europe. Have you seen, uh, well, this comes from John Scallon in the chat. Uh, have you seen politicians, either local, county, state, or even federal, respond to your research? And your historical perspective? Have you oh yes, felt like your a, work has had a, an impact? Yeah, I do. I, I feel like um, some things more than others. I do think there's a little more appetite for, you know, first steps that are a little more symbolic and don't require as much skin in the game, you know? And so I do applaud the first steps, like, you know, I think we could even declare Ojibwe and Dakota, Minnesota, first heritage languages. That'd be like a big political thing in Minnesota. All right, window dressing. But it does have some meaning. If it's first steps, sure, let's do the first steps and the land acknowledgements, which I support because it's first steps. It's opening up space. We can start talking about things. But I think we also need to do the more substantive things. And... Um, I do feel like there is a growing appetite. It may not feel like this in a political sense, like, but there's usually a big disturbance right before growth. You know, we often have something horrible happening, like the Civil War, before a really big progressive, you know, reconstruction, you know, era. We often have like, you know, Vietnam War and civil rights protests, and then you get Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, and a bunch of new progressive things. We're in the disturbance phase right now, but I, I do think we will see positive change coming out of it. Here's, here's one last uh, creative question for you. How would you graphically represent the forest of Minnesota on a new state flag? Currently, the forests are represented by a tree stump. Yes. Oh, man. You, I mean, if you read the Everything You Wanted to Know book, I was kind of railing on the Minnesota state flag a little bit. 
So whatever we get next is going to be better. And I actually saw the legislation, which requires that, um, you know, it limits, like you can't have humans, you know, all kinds of stuff. So like I, it's whatever they do is going to be much better. I think realistically, they're going to end up with something that has maybe like a three-part picture that shows the prairies, the hardwoods, and the pine trees, maybe some water. You know, it'll be something like that in the middle. Whatever it is, it'll be far more benign because right now we've got like a symbol of deforestation with an ax and a gun and like, you know, violence over the land. And then the white farmers coming to industriously you know, farm the land and the Indians like moving off into the sunset or whatever. So I, you know, all of that symbolism problematic, but I, I do think it'll most certainly be better. Um, and it's going to be moving pretty fast. So I think we'll see some images soon. I'm not much of an artist myself, but something like what I was describing, I think I'd be all right with that. All right. Somebody on this call, take it up and get out your uh, graphic design tools and your sketch pads. Yeah, it's going to be open for public comment, and they are at some phase of assembling their committee. So, yeah. I nominate you for the committee. <laughs> I think Ken Whitworth was trying to nominate me for the committee. He's head of the Minnesota Historical Society. We'll see. It depends like, kind of on schedules and stuff, too. Well, I really appreciate your time tonight, uh, Dr. Troyer. Thank you so much. Um, while I have everybody's ears on this call, I do want to remind you about the We Are Water Minnesota interactive traveling exhibit that's at the Stillwater Public Library now through December 3rd. Um, and that project, it, that they take this exhibit to five different locations every year, but then we get St. Croix Valley uh, storytellers, interviewees, St. Croix Valley specific um, information in the exhibit. And so I really recommend going to check it out. Um, the exhibit is developed by the Minnesota Humanities Center in partnership with the Pollution Control Agency. So um, it's got both science and stories and history, and um, you can contribute content to the exhibit exhibit as well. So we want to hear your water stories. So mm -hmm. thank you again for being um, our headliner um, event during this year's We Are Water Minnesota. Dr. Troy, I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight. And look to stcroissplash.org. Um, we have a We Are Water theme page where you can find out all of the other events that are happening between now and the end of the exhibit. So thanks so much. Good night. <laughs>